No one can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus, ride on. No one can hinder him. King Jesus, ride on a milk white horse. No one can hinder him. The river of Jordan he did cross. No one can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. No one can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride on. No one can hinder him. Well, good morning, good morning. We are so glad it's Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Grateful for the triumphal entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. But of course, we know how the story is going to unfold, but we're on this side of history. So we actually know how the story ends and the new beginning that that offers for us all. We're glad that you have come together in worship today. We're glad that we can celebrate with our kids today 
this Palm Sunday. So please be seated and be welcome. Thank you. Great chance for us to see some of God's garden in our midst. Maybe give them another round of applause. As many of you know, if you've been with us these last few weeks during this Lenten season, we have been thinking about the theme of crying out. Crying out to a God who we trust hears us, hears our prayers, and leans into our prayers because God cares. I offer this as we begin this holy week, this glimpse of Psalm 3 that reminds us as we cry out, we are praying to a God who cares. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Does that sound familiar? Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising up against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake up again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me or around me. Rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be upon your people. And as we look back into history, we know that God's blessing has been upon us, continues to promise to be with us. So, my friends, as we gather in worship on this Palm Sunday, 2024, looking ahead to all of what this means, let's celebrate God's faithfulness, that as we cry out, God hears our prayers. Amen. Well, it was a Palm Sunday over 60 years ago that I prayed the first time that I thought someone was actually listening. We had been in our uh, little kids class and the person leading it was talking about that we can believe in Jesus and become his child and uh, all we have to do is, is pray and tell him that we are sorry for the things we've done wrong and we want him to come into our hearts. And in that church, that was a big deal. And it was. I still have that memory. I was probably seven years old, but uh, remember it now this many years later. Palm Sunday, that's how I remember it. Well, let's pray together. 
Our Lord, we may think we understand what's going on and what led to this time and even what's going to happen. But we realize that you are way ahead of us, charting the course, preparing the way, guiding us through the maze of options and choices and next steps. We ask you, Lord, to free us up to praise you for who you are, to be grateful for all that you've done and to celebrate your presence with us in the world. Now, Lord Jesus, you rebuked the religious ones for criticizing your followers, for joyfully celebrating you by saying, if they're quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, Lord, today, if we are hesitant to acknowledge you, will the stones cry out? If we hold back from giving you credit for the good things that happen, will the stones cry out? If we ignore the comfort you give us in very difficult times, will the stones cry out? If we tone down our faith in you as the one who saves us, will the stones cry out? If we fail to express the hope you give, the hope that you are to us, will the stones cry out? And if we withhold our love for you and others, will the very stones cry out? Oh Lord, we are yours available to you to be light and love in this world. Give us your joy and strength to face whatever lies ahead. We believe and affirm that whatever the difficulties, you will prepare us and strengthen us. We believe and affirm that the impact doesn't depend on us. You will use us simply by being ourselves and receiving the power of your example, the power of your spirit, the power of your love. Lord, we believe that you can do far more than we can imagine or even have the nerve to ask, and we thank you. We offer prayers of healing and hope for folks in our congregation today, for Jean Mastain and Praddy Bruflot, prayers of healing, prayers of comfort for Nancy Hutchison at the death of her mother, Mary for Rick Larkin at the death of his brother-in-law, Terry, for Dan Hutchinson at the death of his brother, Bob. And we celebrate and honor and remember the ones we love and know that have gone before. The flowers this morning, given by the Ryerson family in loving memory of Carol and Dr. Philip Ryerson, and all those that come to our minds. Lord, bless our memories, heal the hurts, and help us to celebrate the joys. Now I invite you to pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Saturday, we have our extravaganza. Now, if you've been to this event before, you know how 
wonderfully chaotic and fun and interactive it is. People come from all over, well actually not just the neighborhood, but from different places around the city because they know how much fun it is. They bring their children and they celebrate Easter and they celebrate new life and they celebrate Jesus by having this fun, fun event. So y'all come, bring your grandchildren, bring your children, your nieces, your nephews, your neighbors, whoever you like, but uh, come and join us on Saturday from 10 to 12. Now we have our Holy Week schedule and I wanna take five minutes for each service to tell you, no, I'm not gonna do that. Wednesday is Road to Resurrection. Now this one is, is a little different. We haven't done this before. This is an interactive experience where you and your children or you and whoever you like can go to different spots in the church celebrating and remembering the different aspects of Holy Week. It's an educational but an interactive kind of educational experience. You'll enjoy it. Your kids will learn a great deal and you'll be able to talk and have discussions with your kids, your grandkids, whoever you bring. That's Wednesday night from at 5.30. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, both services at seven o'clock. Saturday, extravaganza, and then Easter sunrise. Uh, I, I predict that the weather's gonna be really good <laughs> at 6.30 on Sunday morning. We've had snow, we've had rain, we've had sleet. Oh, and then one year we had sunshine and warm temperatures. I'm always expecting that to be the case this year. We'll see. Come join us though, 6.30 at Rosalind Park. And then our two services here, Sunday morning, of course, 9.30 traditional and alternative services. We have a service project coming up Wednesday, April 3rd from 5.30 to 7.30, coming and going. Uh, join us for that service project. We'll be putting together various care kits for our mission uh, partners focused on community care. Some of those folks will be speaking a little bit later in the evening, so come and join us. Now, we have an alternative service, and we're looking forward to what's that going to be like in the future. Hannah Alsdorf and a committee of people are going to talk to us about that. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Hannah Alsdorf, and um, as he said, I am one of the members of the Alternative Worship Service Task Force, which is very complicated to say. But <laughs> anyhow, um, our task force was formed because um, the Alternative Service has become and is going to continue to be a critical part of the fabric of uh, the community at Meeting House Church. So we are in the process of planning how to best organize and support this worship expression, and we're trying to gather input. So we have a few ways that you can be involved in that. First is um, we've printed these cards, and they'll be in the hall after the service, so you're welcome to take one of these, reflect, and um, um, give it back to us. There's some buckets, um, or baskets rather, you can put them in. Um, Otherwise, if you prefer to reflect on it, you can look, at, there's an email address on the back of the cards and you're welcome to provide us with your feedback through email. Or you can um, come to me or one of the other members of the task force um, to discuss in person and we're happy to get your feedback that way. But um, essentially, you know, we're trying to do the good, hard work of planning, organizing, and sustaining, and also nurturing this alternative uh, worship service. So we invite your prayers along the way. We're seeking God's grace and wisdom, and continuing to create this worship expression to reflect our mission, vision, and core values here at Meeting House Church. So this is where we say, welcome beloved, we're risking the messy path of faith together, and we wanna meet with Jesus, each other, and our neighbors. So as we grow in Christ and serve the world, we really appreciate your input and your help um, in giving us guidance as we do this process. So thank you. Thank you much. Just a reminder, you can go online and see the alternative service or the traditional service uh, any time you like, so you can experience both. Now, let's stand together and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
Be seated. The scripture for today is from Luke, Luke 19. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their cloaks on the, on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. Now as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that he had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The word of the Lord. God, we come to this Palm Sunday with <clears throat> mixed emotions. On the one side, we are grateful for the realization of who you are, the conquering Messiah who has come to conquer the kingdoms of our hearts, that we might experience the fullness of life you desire for us. But we know this story. We've celebrated and remembered and stood in the midst of this story many times. But we pray that this Holy Week, that we might truly, in a new way, grasp the story that will draw us even to a deeper relationship with you. That as we cry out to you, we will know that you hear our prayers. So Lord, come into the, our midst even now, for we pray in your name. Amen. As you know, there's a little glass of water up here. And from time to time, the ushers write little notes. They said, Jeff, happy, happy Hosanna. <laughs> it's, not, it's not as good as the days when there used to be a Diet Mountain Dew up here, but not everything's perfect. A little girl was sick on Palm Sunday and stayed home from church with her mom. Her dad returned from church holding a palm branch. The little girl was curious and asked, why do you have a palm branch, Dad? You see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches today on Palm Sunday. The little girl replied, ah, oh, darn. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. Today, of course, is Palm Sunday, the day taken from the Gospels, where a whole city threw a parade for Jesus. As Jesus rode into the city, people threw palm branches in anticipation of his coming. Thus we get the name, Palm Sunday. This day marks the time of celebration when Jesus was worshipped and praised. Sometimes it's even called the triumphal. Entry. 
As we trace the events of Jesus last week, maybe we will become more interested in why these events matter. Because they changed history, didn't they? They can change our lives as well, if we will let them. The apostle Peter sums it up when he writes, For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. So shouldn't this Jesus story be our story as well? Every week? On the surface, the entrance into the city looked like a welcoming party for a victorious king. But not everyone was happy. That first day of Jesus last week was a day of mixed emotions for those gathered in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was crowded for the Passover feast. A hundred thousand or better were in the city that day. That was the sixth time so that was six times the typical population because Passover is the biggest event of the Jewish faith. It marked the Hebrew people's deliverance from slavery in Egypt and their march to the promised land. But this Passover was different. Jesus was in town. For three years, Jesus had traveled across Israel, teaching and performing life-altering miracles. Jesus had been in Jerusalem before, but this time it was different, and Jesus knew it. He had been telling his disciples that something big was about to happen. The word had spread. Expectations were high. The peace that could come from a long-awaited Messiah was here if they would turn to it. Jesus had two of his disciples borrow an unbroken young donkey for him to ride into the city on. And that was strange in and of itself. The procession begins as Jesus and his followers came over a hill called the Mount of Olives just east of the city. The hilltop stood 200 feet above the temple, looking into the capital city. And the road winds its way down the hill through the olive groves, heading directly through the eastern gate into Jerusalem. Crowds, crowds gathered along the route. And they began to lay cloaks and palm branches across the path, rolling out their version of the proverbial red carpet. Cheers rang out. Hosanna, they cried. The words meant Jehovah saves. It was that cry and the song, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, which comes from Psalm 118, that filled the air. Others shouted out, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. How fitting. That words almost identical to the angel's song at Jesus' birth should also announce the beginning of Jesus last week. This peace, this shalom is what Israel longed for. It's the peace we long for and often are crying out in our thoughts, in our prayers, from our life, for our spirit to experience through the power of God. An experience that could change our homes, our communities, our country, even the world. A peace that satisfies and lasts. A peace that only comes from a faithful God to an open heart that is turned to receive it. A peace we then in turn can offer to others. Yes, Jesus enters the city on the donkey. The crowd is excited and cheering. And I suppose there were lots of reasons why. Some were likely just curious. What's going on? 
You know how a crowd can build at times. People hear the noise and come to find out what's happening. And they have joined in before they know it. But they really don't have a clue what's actually going on. But others are cheering because, because of the stories of Jesus' miracles that have spread throughout the land. They begin to follow Jesus to see what he might do next. That had happened in Galilee before, just a couple of years earlier, when Jesus said, miraculously fed 5,000 with a little boy's lunch. He got a following then. But this Passover, word of something even more significant had spread throughout the city. The Apostle John's gospel linked these events to the raising of Lazarus from the dead just a week earlier. Some would have been cheering in that crowd that day because they wanted to see him do that again. Could there be in that crowd those who hope to be the recipient of that next miracle? Perhaps they shouted like when a kid waves their hand in class and shouts, teacher, teacher, choose me, choose me. Surely the cloud included those whom Jesus had already touched, don't you think? The Gospels don't tell us, but I can't help but wonder if Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, weren't right there in the front row. If so, then Zacchaeus was likely not far behind. Then it's Mary Magdalene who experienced Jesus' amazing grace. Bartimaeus, the formerly blind man from Jericho. The Samaritan woman from the well. The lame man from the pool of Bethsaida. And who knows how many others could have filled that crowd. Wouldn't they have been there cheering on their hero? Outcasts and tax collectors, even some lepers. Wouldn't they have wanted to be there to celebrate their friend? To welcome him to Jerusalem? Weren't they there to welcome and celebrate their friend who had brought peace and order to those things that they had been crying out for? Jesus, as we know from the gospel accounts, had touched so many lives. At least a few of them would have been in that crowd that day, lining the road leading to Jerusalem. Isn't that why many of us are here today? We know what Jesus has done for us, and we aren't afraid to let everyone know how grateful we are For that's at the heart of true worship. It's about offering our gratitude to Jesus, surrounded by like-minded people. A big part of the crowd that day must have wondered if they were inaugurating a new king, however. First century Jews looked forward to the day when God would send his angelic army to liberate Jerusalem once and for all from the Romans. The Messiah would lead the way, riding on a great white stallion with his sword flashing in the sun. Well, that's what they expected. They were in for a surprise. That's probably the point of the young donkey, don't you think? It's just the opposite. So if this was the Messiah, he had already, he was already not living up to others' expectations. He was already not living up to others' expectations. Well, I can make that mistake sometimes. I often recreate God's image as I think God should be. Because imaginary gods always take our side. They always come through with our hopes and wishes. They, They condemn other people's sins, but never ours. They solve all our problems and meet all of our needs. Right? Sounds more like a genie from a lamp to me than a God who seeks to guide us and lead us and promises to always be faithfully with us in the midst of all of life. 
But the fact that he didn't live up to some of their expectations might, might be the reason why Palm Sunday becomes Good Friday. But we don't have to wait for Friday to see the shouts of joy turn to cries of disappointment and anger, even in our story today. If you listen close, you can hear the scoffing in this Sunday's crowd as well. Some of the crowd challenged Jesus to quiet the parade. But the problem wasn't the noise. It was what the group was saying, not how they were saying it. Jealousy and fear drove the opposition to Jesus that day as well. The religious leaders were worried that a rumor of conquering Messiah might spark a reaction from the Romans. The high priest would argue later in the week, better for one man to die than our whole country punished. It seems difficult for me to understand why anyone would find fault with Jesus, though. How could anyone not appreciate his message <clears throat> of God loves you? Love your neighbor. Be nice to your enemies. Surely everyone wants his peace on earth and goodwill towards others, don't they? Some followers of Jesus perceive Jesus as meek and mild. Followers of the meek and mild Jesus are easily confused with this week. Maybe some of the scoffing that comes from the crowd comes from those who are paying more attention than we are. Perhaps they know there is more to Jesus than the tiny baby in the manger. They see through the simple message of kindness and universal tolerance. Maybe they clearly understand the implications of God's invitation to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow. Perhaps they realize Jesus never left room for the middle ground between belief and action, between faith and following. Jesus is many things, but just nice does not tell the whole story. So maybe some scoffed at first Palm Sunday because they weren't going to be surprised on Monday when anything but a meek and mild Jesus marched into the temple with fire in his eyes and turned the tables over, demanding they stop disgracing his father's temple, his father's house. Our text records another revealing moment on that first day of Jesus last week. For we will never fully understand Holy Week until we see Jesus' heart-wrenching tears. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what his part is and the ramifications that will have for his people. As the story goes, suddenly the parade grinds to a halt. Those in the rear probably wondered, what's happening? What's going on up there? Everyone stops for no apparent reason. But partway down the parade route, Jesus has stopped. Maybe he rounded a turn coming down that winding path. Perhaps they arrived at a clearing in the olive, olive trees. But Jesus stops and looks at the city of Jerusalem spread out before him. I know firsthand that the view of Jerusalem from that Mount of Olives is a breathtaking sight. Jesus is looking into Jerusalem. Jesus looks down at the crowded streets, the busy marketplaces, and the row after row of houses. He could see the temple in the distance, in all its glory. Was he pondering the centuries of history that had taken place on that same patch of land? David, Solomon, Isaiah, Nehemiah, Ezra, all the great heroes of Israel's nation had stood on that same hillside and look down at that great city. But there's more. My friends, there's more to the tears than nostalgia. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He knows what has happened before, and he knows what's coming next. This parade was no accident. I believe Jesus knew what he would face by week's end. Didn't Jesus tell his disciples that he had come to die? He would be betrayed by a friend, 
tormented by his foes, and eventually crucified for the sins of the world. But they refused to hear him. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to believe. So were the tears of Jesus, partially over the realization that many of his followers didn't get it? They just didn't get it. The tears must be flowing because he knows what will happen next. The Son of Man has seen the end from the beginning. He knows the consequences of the rejection he will face that week. He knows the judgment and destruction that will come to this city that has rejected the offer of God's mercy and grace. Jesus must have wanted it to turn out differently, but it wouldn't. If he were the kind of savior who forced people to follow him, who made decisions for them, it would have been different. But it's not the way it works, does it? A couple of days later, he says in Matthew's gospel, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. I wonder if we saw what Jesus sees, if we might not shed more tears. I wonder if we were to put our faith more in Jesus and less in ourselves, if we might not shed more tears, motivating us to lean into our relationship with Jesus in new ways, more profound ways, leading us to a deeper faith and deeper devotion. Holy Week gives us that opportunity. If we were to lean in that direction, would we have more passion for Jesus, more passion for others? If we truly understood Jesus' love for us, for the world better, wouldn't that motivate the way we show up in new ways? This Holy Week is the beginning of the end. The first day of Jesus last week. And we know what the end days have done for us. The prophet Isaiah wrote so poignantly of the people of God 600 years earlier than our passage for today. Reminding us about God. That my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We don't always get it. We don't always fully understand it. But we can trust in a faithful, loving God. This Jesus who is entering Jerusalem on the donkey today wants to change the way that we see life, our lives, Change the way we understand God. That God we continue to cry out to. Change the way we live our lives and invite us to turn to the hope that will be the change we deeply long for. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, God allows himself to be edged out of the world and onto a cross. And that is how he can be with us and help us. Only a suffering God can help. The first century crowds wanted what they wanted and desired what they thought they needed. A warrior king. But Jesus, Jesus came as a suffering Messiah. Jesus came as the one who would go as far as the cross to show us how to die to our own will and seek God's will. Many in that crowd that day missed the point. But what about us? Do we get it? Will we get it? Will we follow the one who came in the name of the Lord? Well, his name is Jesus. So my friends, join me. Join me this Holy Week as we 
turn together to the one who is and will forever be for us. Friends, may God bless your Holy Week journey as we journey to the cross together all the way to the empty tomb. Amen. God, we are grateful for this story. We're grateful for the way the church year lines up that we celebrated just a few months ago. The birth of God's son who came into this world to show us what it looks like to live a faithful life. And now we're at Easter. On the doorstep anyway. We know. We know how this week goes. And we know because of its routine how we can sometimes show up. But God, let it be different this year. May your spirit be so close that we can tangibly sense your presence. That will buoy up in us, each of us, a courage to follow you in a new way. That's our hope. That's our prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Well, we have an opportunity now to praise and worship God by offering him our gifts. You can do so by placing it in the plate as it comes past in just a moment. You can do it online or you can do it at the box that's out in the commons. So give generously, give joyfully as an act of worship. That's the usher to come now.
good Lord's done been here, blessed my soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here, blessed my soul and gone. Never did I think that he was so nigh, blessed my soul and gone. He spoke and he made me laugh and cry, bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone. Sin her better mind how you walk on the cross. Bless my soul and gone. Your foot might slip and your soul get lost. Bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here. Bless my soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here. Bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here. Bless soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here and he bless my soul, bless my soul, bless my soul and I thought maybe he's going to go up another note. I thought, wow, wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Let's pray. God, we offer these gifts as we offer our lives. Thank you for this story of you coming to Jerusalem, recognizing our needs. We recognize our needs. We recognize how as we cry out to you, you meet us in our needs, fulfill our needs. So receive this offering as we support the good work you continue to do in us and through us. Bless these offerings as we seek to be a blessing to you. For we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand together and sing our last hymn.
That's a big finish right there. As I was watching our wonderful crowd people come up and down the stairs several times, Tom, I was thinking about your knee surgery that's coming. And I'm like, oh, we need to get him his new knee. Oh, my goodness. And grateful that we are going to have a white Christmas after all. So it's awesome. We have some donut holes and some coffee, a good experience, a good opportunity, a good reason to stay around and chat with some folks. Maybe you need to meet a new friend or catch up with someone you haven't caught up with for a while. I want to personally invite you, as Mark did so wonderfully, I want to personally invite you to this journey this week. Come and be a part of Wednesday. Come Thursday and Friday. Well, maybe come early Sunday morning, but come Sunday morning and bring a friend or two. Let's celebrate this event. Let's take it all in. Let's hear that story again and let it transform us. As we cry out, oh God, do your good work in us. God will do it if we allow him to. Go from this place knowing the peace that God offers in his son Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.